from Music City, USA, it's David Hooper and Music Business Radio. Welcome to Music Business Radio. I'm Dan Buckley sitting in for David Hooper today. And joining me on the program are two Nashville-based singers and songwriters that are related to each other. we got John Hyde and Lily Hyde here at the Lightning 100 Studios. How's it going? Doing well. How are you? <laughs> I'm awesome. I'm so excited to have you both here on the show. That was Lily, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I'm, I'm, I'm going to get this. I'm going to keep getting this mixed up, I think. <laughs> That's that's no good at all. Have the two of you ever done an interview before? No. Have we? I don't think we have. No, I don't think we have. No, we haven't collaborated as much as you might have think we have. No. <laughs> we're, we're weird, creepy singer-songwriters, and we've got to keep to ourselves. Gotta keep. <laughs> we're loners. <laughs> uh, I, I believe mm. maybe around 2008, you guys did share the stage. Uh, yeah. For the, was that the first time sharing the stage? Was it, Lil? I think at Ravinia, I sang with you. That's or right. For the yeah. first time. But yeah, we've done some yeah, stuff we've done, together. We've done some sure. since. We did something in Texas uh, a year or two ago. And yeah, and I opened some shows for yeah, you. Yeah, of course But we did, did not You're, once collab, like, do any harmonizing or anything that whole tour. Is that, is that weird? We're weird. Well, we're just we kind of weird. We should do more of that. Yeah. <laughs> There's plenty of time. <laughs> she, they, they showed up in one of your songs uh, when you referenced uh, yelling at the kids, banging in the back like Charlie Watts. Yeah. Uh, every time I, I hear that song, I think of Lily. <laughs> she was back there. She she wasn't banging like Charlie Watts, so she, she used to have a thing with uh, Cheesy Puffs. Oh, yeah. We used to call them Cheesy Puffs, but what were they? Cheetos or whatever those things are. Yeah. And she, we took a trip once, and she, we looked back. She was only two, and she had covered herself and the entire back seat. You know that orange stuff oh, you get yeah. on your hands that you can't get off? It was everywhere. She was orange. <laughs> Not much has changed. So. John Hyde, how, how many kids do you have? And is Lily the only uh, musician? I have three. Uh, there's three of them. My son Rob is uh, the oldest. He's, what is Rob, 36? 36, 30, yes, 30, 30, 36. 36. And uh, Lily, and then uh, Georgia Ray, who just turned 26. Yep. Lily, of course, uh, is uh, doing the music thing. Georgia's got stuff in her, and she hasn't pursued it yet. But uh, if she wanted to, in some form or fashion, she probably could. Uh, she definitely got the writing. Yeah, the she's writing. a really good writer. She's got the writing thing. And Rob is uh, such a huge fan that he, I mean, he might as well be playing music in a way. I mean, he just loves it so much. Yeah. He's visually very artistic, too. Exactly. Yeah, thank you for saying that. Yeah, he's a, he's got lots of talent. Well, his name actually comes up doing research on you, because one of the records that you did, I think it was back in 1993, Perfectly Good Guitar, he turned you on to Faith No More. That's right. And Matt Wallace had produced that record. That is correct. And that yeah. was one of like your highest charting albums. Yeah, how about that? It was all downhill from there, Danny. <laughs> 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 no, uh, yeah, that's that's right. Yeah, well, that's that's kind of what he's done all his life for me. He said uh, he kind of is always turning me on to new music, new visual arts, new ways of thinking. I mean, he's just a brilliant guy. Got John and Lily Hyatt here in the Music Business Radio studios today, John. I'd love to hear your story and and take it back to to your beginnings. Talk about when you were a kid and the music that influenced you were you big into elvis presley well you know i was aware of elvis uh my brothers my older brothers uh were into him and, and uh, my mother was a huge elvis fan so so consequently uh we went up to this lake in the in this every summer my grandpa had a little fishing cabin up there a little funky place and we'd go into the movies in the uh, little small town up there on on the weekends, and uh, it was always an Elvis movie. I mean, she took me to, I think I saw every Elvis movie. And, you know, that was my first big influence was, I want to be that guy. You know, he's cool, he always gets the girls, and uh, he sounds great, and, uh, you know, that's what I want to do. Talk about how you got started as a musician in the road to Nashville. After I picked up the guitar at 11, of course, that would have been about 1963, so... We put together these little sock hop kind of bands, and we'd play, you know, what was on the radio. And it was, you know, it was sort of the golden age of AM radio. You had, 
you know, the Beatles were on, and then the Rolling Stones, and then you'd have Otis Redding, then Aretha Franklin, and they all played on, they were all on the same station, you know. Not that much pigeonholing in those days. So that's what I started playing with my colleagues there in the sixth grade. <laughs> and uh, we, we had little dance bands, and, and then it just kind of blew into, uh, you know, I kept playing with guys, friends, and uh, got turned on to folk music when I was about 15, and Bob Dylan, and then the blues and all that stuff. It's kind of the same progression I've seen each one of my kids go through. And then, yeah, I came here when I was 18. I liked Nashville. I'd passed through on one of my, my many attempts to run away from home, and uh, I liked the place. And uh, I met a guy here named Bob Frank, who was a folk singer. He was from Memphis, and he had a deal with Vanguard Records. And I thought, well, you don't have to be a country guy to get something going here. And so that's what drew me to Nashville. Tell us about getting your first job as a songwriter. How'd you get that? Well, I had a tape that I made with a friend of mine. Uh, it's actually my brother-in-law, Jack uh, Sexton, and uh, he had two two-track tape machines. And so we made this. I made this elaborate, you know, demo, bouncing stuff back and forth, and trying to be I don't know what, but it wasn't very good. And I, I brought that down. I was playing that for these publishers, and you know, they just they just didn't hear it, <laughs> mainly because it wasn't there. So. And then, so the last, uh, I called the last one, it was Tree Publishing. And they said, well, you got a tape? Yeah, I'd have a tape. I said, no, I just got to sing you the stuff. and Because I knew the tape wasn't working. And uh, this guy, Larry Henley, who uh, sang in a group, I can't remember the name of the group, but they did that song, I Like Bread and Butter, back in the 60s. The Easy Beats, I think, or the New Beats one. And he, uh, I can't, went into his office, he listened to me, and then uh, he called his boss down, Buddy Killen. They said, well, what are you looking for? And I knew Bob Franks was getting 25 bucks a week from his publishing company to write songs. So I said, I want 25 bucks a week. <laughs> and they said, signed! <laughs> but, you know, it was great. I was, all of a sudden, I was a pro, you know. I was writing songs and getting paid for it. Live, living the dream. I was living the dream, man. I had a, a room on the road, cost me eleven bucks a week. I, uh, you know, I, I smoked in those days. I bought roll your own tobacco, and I bought beer in quarts. I was drinking in those days. I bought my beer in quarts, the cheapest you could get, and uh, ate a lot of bologna and beans. You know, but I was writing songs. It was great. Where would you draw your inspiration to write songs? Would you read books, watch movies, or just make stuff up? Yeah, all that, all that stuff. And, the, you know, the group of people I was running with, we had, you know, in those days, Guy Clark had just come to town. Uh, Diane Davidson, who uh, who was from here and great singer, did a great version of Delta Dawn, that famous uh, uh, Alex. Uh, God, I can't think of his last name, man. I'm getting old. but uh, Beats the alternative. Yeah, yeah, right. Uh, a guy named Chris Gantry was here uh, in those days. He wrote uh, Dreams of the Everyday Housewife. But he was his thing was much a much broader stroke than that. But just a lot of crazy young singer songwriters. Townsman Sant would come through town, you know, just a bunch of nuts trying to, you know, write songs. And and we were a little bit on the odd side of Nashville in those days, you know. And uh, there was a couple guys that uh, that opened a club uh, called the Exit Inn just so this group of oddballs would have a place to play. I mean, that's why they opened it. That's awesome. Yeah, uh, Brew Reynolds and Owsley uh, Manier, wonderful guys. And so they opened this joint so us weirdos would have a place to get up and sing our songs. Thus, the exit in was born. And it, and it started buzzing pretty soon, you know. And within a year or two, you know, there were, you know, national acts coming through and playing shows. And, you know, we'd do our own shows on the weeknights and so on. And so we had, most of us were getting some kind of little draw from a publishing company. And here we had a place to play and we hung out and... You know, it was like, uh, I don't know, a little our own little Greenwich Village, I guess, you know. I bet you have some good good memories. Yeah, it was fantastic. I didn't realize that was that was how the exit in was even yeah. even established. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You've really seen Nashville change. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you hang around long enough, you start sounding like your grandparents, you know. It's like, well, when I was a boy. <laughs> you know, it's like, but, yeah, it's a totally different city and, uh, and uh, you know. It's it's great. Everything changes, and that's the name of the game. Was your first song that got picked up for Three Dog Night? That's right, yeah. I had actually met a guy named Travis Rivers 
a wonderful guy from Texas, still a dear friend today, and he got me a meeting with a with this guy Don Ellis, not the jazz musician, but a guy that worked for Epic Records up in New York, and he was in town, and so <laughs> Travis had me play for for him, and they said, "Well, we'll sign you. You can make a single, you know, forty five. We'll see if we can get something going." And so I did that, and the, nothing happened, and then I did another one. I mean, I started working with another guy. We, we did an album on the same budget as you would do a single. That's where I learned thrifty recording, by the way. And so they said, well, we'll put the album out. And sure as I'm sitting here, was was on it. And that's that's how Three Dog Night heard, heard the song. But yeah, that was my first, not my first cut. Tracy Nelson did uh, Thinking of You when I first got to town. I was 18. It was my first cut. So do you remember hearing your song by three dog night on the radio like, oh my god yeah. what was that experience like you know you just it's indescribable it's like winning the stanley cup or something you know it's just awesome yeah it was great got john hyatt and lily hyatt here in the lightning 100 studios this is uh your hometown radio station yes you've made a home of it here and you've had uh so many songs and lily following in your footsteps uh lily are or are you following in his footsteps are you hoping anyone will, will pick up your songs you're just you just uh i think finished your your second solo album yes i did i mean we made it with a band but yep it's under my name lily hyatt so yeah i'd totally love someone to pick up one of my songs <laughs> go for it <laughs> i love singing them too so whatever either way i'm happy as a kid growing up and your your dad's John Hyatt, this great songwriter, what are some of the things like you learned from him, like watching him write songs? I've learned a whole lot from him. And it's funny because when I was younger, I just, my view of things was so different. It's just, I grew up with music in my household. That's what my dad did. And just probably like any kid, when you see your parent do something and you have a knack for it yourself, I'm like, oh, I'm going to do that. And I didn't know all the dues I'd have to pay. And I'm still paying down the line. You know, I didn't know how much effort had to go into it. But, you know, I'm very observant. And um, it's not like it was getting shoved down my throat like, this is how you write. This is what you do. But I always looked up to my dad. So I was always kind of watching in the wings, taking notes myself because that's something that's really important to me in my life writing and singing and and i figure he's got a tip or two i could learn a few things so yeah i might say i've taken notes john hyatt and lily hyatt are guests today on music business radio more from them when we return This is Neela from the Lumineers. You're listening to Music Business Radio, your backstage pass to the music biz. This Friday, Lightning 100 will be broadcasting live from Casio's booth at Summer Nam in the Music City Center. Tune in from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. to hear live performances from Daniel Ellsworth and Marie Hines. Afterwards, head down to the Poor House Nashville to see them plus Tom Brisling. The show is free and music starts at 7.30 p.m. The fun doesn't end there. Saturday, the Summer Nam show is open to the public for Music Industry Day. Come on down and check out new music gear, including the latest in keyboard technology at the Casio booth. Number 9. 10. Casio is also teaming up with Lightning 100 to give away a Privia PX350 88 note digital piano to one lucky listener. All you have to do is like Casio on Facebook at facebook.com slash Casio Music Gear or follow them on Twitter at Casio Keys. Do it by July 28th and you'll be entered to win. Tickets for NAM are available at nam.org slash music industry day or at the door. For more information on all the events, check out casiomusicgear.com or lightning100.com. Hey, this is Pete Yorn, and you're listening to Music Business Radio. You're listening to Music Business Radio. I'm Dan Buckley in for David Hooper today. Our guest, John Hyatt and Lily Hyatt, two great singer and songwriters here from Nashville, Tennessee. They're, it's a father and daughter show today here on the program. I'm excited to be able to get you both in here. Lily following in John's footsteps. John has uh, released 21 studio albums, maybe on the verge of 22. or Yeah, probably. 